God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Hello, I'm Pastor Gervais Charmley. Welcome back to Bethel Evangelical Free Church Hanley on YouTube. In this video, I'm continuing the series on these old works of Christian theology, the Cunningham Lectures, and the subject in this video is this volume, The Christian Doctrine of Reconciliation, by the Reverend James Denny, D.D., Cunningham Lectures for 1917. The Great War has come in between this volume and the previous. The Great War has raged across Europe. Millions are dead. The map of Europe is in the process of being redrawn, the map of the world, as German colonies are to be redistributed. The world has changed since George Stevens' Psychology of the Christian Soul was written and published and James Denny himself the Cunningham lecturer will never give his lectures he died when he had written them but he had not delivered them and it's not it's really necessary to say that probably had Denny finished his lectures he would have revised them and they would not look the way they do but so it was well James Denny is probably one of the best known of these early 20th century Cunningham lecturers his great work of course is this one the death of Christ it was republished by IVP and the Christian Doctrine of Reconciliation can be found in a, a more modern republication who was James Denny, this famous theologian in his day, a man who still read, and still read with profit? Well, James Denny was born on the 5th of February, 1856, in the town of Paisley, in Scotland. But his family moved to Greenock just four months after his birth, and so he never knew Paisley. He was a, a Greenock boy. His family were not Free Church of Scotland, they were not Church of Scotland, they belonged to the Reformed Presbyterian Church of Scotland, a very small denomination, just has a few, a few congregations now. It was much bigger, however, in 1856, because in 1876 the majority of its congregations merged with the Free Church of Scotland, and the, the modern-day... Reformed Presbyterian Church is like the modern day Free Church, it's the, the people who stayed out of the Union. Now the modern day Reformed Presbyterian Church is even smaller because a lot of its churches, including the one in Greenock, closed in the 20th century. James Denny's father was a deacon in the Reformed Presbyterian Church at Greenock. And Denny was brought up in Greenock, as I say, he was educated at the Highlanders Academy in Greenock, and he went off then to university in Glasgow, not to Edinburgh. In 1883, he went up to the Free Church College in Glasgow. And there he was deeply influenced by particularly A.B. Bruce, who was the New Testament lecturer, the New Testament professor. The principal at the time was George Douglas, who was an Old Testament professor. The faculty also included T.M. Lindsay, the church historian, and also Cunningham Lecturer. And A.B. Bruce, of course, was a Cunningham Lecturer, and the systematics professor at the time was... James Candlish, who also delivered Cunningham Lectures. I don't have his Cunningham Lectures, they were on the Kingdom of God. And you note that out of that faculty, only one of them was not a Cunningham Lecturer. 
So yes, the Cunningham Lectures tended to favour new college graduates, but at the same time, Glasgow professors included a lot of Cunningham lectures of Cunningham lecturers. James Candlish was the son of Robert Candlish, principal of New College, Minister of Free St George's in Edinburgh, and James Candlish was noted for the fact that he used his textbook, the medulla, the marrow of theology, of the Puritan aims. His textbook, in other words, was a Latin Puritan book, which tells you a lot about him. But it was Bruce who was the main influence on Denny, so that Denny ends up in the same kind of apologetic theological school as Bruce. And Bruce has his massive drawback, his massive weakness is the concessive apologetic. I spoke about that in the video on Bruce, so I'm not going to go into it now. But Denny said of Bruce, he let me see Jesus, and this, this is why he was the great influence. He, Denny has this very definite view, Christ as the centre. He wrote his first book when he was at the Free Church College, and it was a trenchant review of a popular book at the time by Henry Drummond. Now, Henry Drummond would, after Denny's graduation, become a professor at the Free Church College in Glasgow. It's a very good thing he wasn't a professor when Denny was there, because there are very few things that are more damaging to a young man's prospects than having a, an argument in print with one of his professors. It really reflects badly on him, but Drummond had many problems. Alexander White of Free St George's, who himself, of course, was not a man without flaws, but who is a man without flaws, I mean Jesus. But Alexander White summed up the problem with, with Henry Drummond, saying, The trouble with Henry is he doesn't ken anything about sin. He doesn't know anything about sin. C.H. Spurgeon described Drummond's most famous book, The Greatest Thing in the World, as the strangest thing in the world, the gospel, with the gospel left out. And the book of Drummond's that Denny objected to was a book called On Natural Law in the Spiritual World. Natural Law in the Spiritual World. And Denny replies in a book called On Natural Law in the Spiritual World by a brother of the natural man. And his book, I haven't read it, it's a very rare book, but his book is apparently a trenchant critique of Drummond. Drummond's book is bad. Because what Drummond does is, Drummond's an obsessive with evolution. He's not just a, a theistic evolutionist. He's a man who tries to, to spiritualise evolution, to make evolution the lens through which the Bible is interpreted. He, one of his famous books is called The Ascent of Man, which of course is a, a riff off the title of, of Darwin's book, The Descent of Man. But this causes, of course, all kinds of problems. If you try to make Christianity not just compatible with, with evolution, but evolutionary, you create trouble. And Denny's objection was, with this natural or the spiritual world, that it's so it takes this analogy of the natural and the spiritual to such an, a, a, an absurd degree that it means there's no distinction between the two. Well, Denny doesn't seem to have suffered as a result, thankfully. While he was at the college in Glasgow, he served as a, a missioner, a missionary, in the Hill Street Mission of St John's Free Church in Glasgow. So he was basically leading a mission hall. And this missionary impulse, this home mission impulse, remains with him throughout his life. His, after his graduation, he was appointed to the, he's called to the East Free Church, Browty Ferry, where he succeeded 
not immediately of course, but he did succeed, A.B. Bruce. A.B. Bruce had been minister of the same congregation. And there would be many men in the congregation, many men and women who, who had known Bruce and who appreciated this man who appreciated him. On the 1st of July 1886 he married. He married a, a woman called May Carmichael Brown. And she was an enormous help to him. Because one of the things that had happened at the Free Church College was he'd be introduced to a lot of German liberal theology. And the trouble with a lot of this German liberal theology is it's very much it's Christless Christianity and it's crossless Christianity. And he found himself drifting from the moorings. And Mrs. Denny, Mrs. Denny loved reading Spurgeon. And she knew that Spurgeon kept her looking unto Jesus. And so she said to her husband, Try reading Spurgeon, dear. She didn't push anything on him. She didn't give him a tongue lashing. She said, I think this will help. And it did. And he found his anchor again. And anchored on the rock who is Christ. During his time as a, a minister, he preached a number of series of expository sermons. The first of which was a series on the Thessalonians, the Epistles to the Thessalonians. And these were published as a volume of the Expositor's Bible, this is my copy, in 1892. 1892. The Expositor's Bible was edited by William Robertson Nicoll, editor of the magazine, theological magazine, The Expositor hence the title, The Expositor's Bible. And the Thessalonian epistles were, the Thessalonian sermons were greeted with great enthusiasm so that a second volume was asked for. And in 1894 appeared his sermons on the second epistle to the Corinthians. He did not write on 1st Corinthians, although, and I've seen this, sadly I, I didn't get the copy, I didn't get a copy, but there is a, out there, a printing of a commentary on 1st Corinthians that has James Denny's name on the spine. This is a mistake, it was a second edition I believe, or certainly a cheaper edition of the Expositor's Bible, and that particular volume in the Expositor's Bible is actually by Marcus Dodds, and he's greatly inferior, in my opinion, to Denny. Now, James Denny had been a minister at Browty Ferry since 1886. In 1893, he was invited to deliver a series of lectures at the Theological Seminary in Glasgow. But before going on to there, just get a, a picture of him. There he is. This is uh, in, his, in the, the memoir published after his death, James Denny. And these studies in theology were the result of his Chicago lectures. He was invited to deliver them, and he delivered a series on systematic theology. Lectures delivered in Chicago Theological Seminary by the Reverend James Denny, D.D., 1895. It was largely on the strength of this work that he was invited in 1897 to take the systematics chair in the Free Church College, Glasgow, something that he swiftly accepted. He replaced... James Candlish, and of course he was a very different man from Candlish. He was not a man who would be lecturing on a, a Puritan textbook. But he was a man who stood very much in the tradition of that college. In 1915, he succeeded T.M. Lindsay as the principal of what was now the United Free Church College. But in 1907 his wife had died, and she had been very much that rock for him in his life. The result was that after her death he was never quite the same again. There was a, a sadness over him. 
until 10 years later, in the summer of 1917, he died, aged only 61. His lectures were therefore left, as I say, undelivered, but they are an interesting return to the subject that he dealt with in his most famous book on the death of Christ in 1902. It was succeeded by The Atonement of the Modern Mind, which B.B. Warfield wrote a, a review of, that was generally appreciative, but he said, it must be remembered there is in fact only one mind, the human mind. The modern mind <coughs> is simply a variation of the human mind, the mind that all human beings have. There is, of course, no preface to his lectures, because he died before he could revise them. And they've been criticised in some ways for going back from the clear teaching of the, death of, of the death of Christ. But I do wonder, is it that he had changed or is it that they weren't really finished yet? Would they have been delivered as they are? We do not know. We cannot tell. It's a book that speaks of the realities of reconciliation, the need to be reconciled to God, how sin is to be dealt with, and it's to be dealt with by an atonement, even the atonement of Christ, so that Denny can write, we do not first repent of our sins and then come to Jesus. It is the visitation of our life by Jesus to which we owe first repentance and then all other spiritual blessings. Because there is this idea that some people have that you need to somehow have preparation before coming to Christ. And then he says, no, actually, it's the other way around. It is, you come, it is Christ comes to you. You'll notice that he doesn't even say that you come to Jesus and then repent. He says, Jesus comes to you and then you repent. And that is wonderfully biblical. Jesus comes to you and then you repent. It's not a matter of you coming to Jesus. We do indeed invite people to come unto Jesus, recognising, however, that no one will come to him unless the Father draws him. Again, Denny writes, If the mistake has sometimes been made of speaking of Christ's death as a thing by itself, which could be studied and appreciated and even preached as gospel, apart either from Jesus or his life, we must not, in avoiding it, fall into the opposite error and think that we can appreciate Jesus fully, even his character of reconciler, though we do not think of him in his cross and passion. The place given to the death of Christ in the New Testament peremptorily forbids this to the Christian reader. Reconciliation to God is through the death of Christ, through the cross of Christ. There is no reconciliation apart from his death, so it is that Denny writes, Reconciliation to God comes through God's forgiveness of all of that by which we have been estranged from him. And of all experience in the religion of sinful men, he is the most deeply felt and the most far-reaching. We don't need to measure what is its what is is or is not within its power, but everyone who knows what it is to be forgiven knows also that forgiveness is the greatest regenerative force in the life of man. Just because the experience of reconciliation is the central and fundamental experience of Christian religion, the doctrine of reconciliation is not so much one doctrine as the inspiration and focus of all. It is not just one doctrine, he says, it is the inspiration and focus of all. How marvellous it is to, to dwell upon reconciliation. There's so much in this book. It's difficult to select what extracts to read. But here's another one. It is only as part of the whole to which such ideas are native and self-evident that we can take in what the New Testament tells of the death of Christ as a death for sin. A martyr's death, heroic and inspiring as it may be, is not in this sense a death for sin. <coughs> it may quite well be a death for righteousness. It may quite well be a death from which others reap spiritual benefits, benefits of which the martyrdom may be called the price. 
and it has the hero the death of Jesus was of course a martyr's death and has this heroic and inspiring quality. No doubt also, like every great act of self sacrifice, it has brought advantage to the race. But this is not only unequal to what the New Testament means when it says that he bore our sins, or that he suffered for sins once, the just for the unjust, or that he made purgation of sins, or that he put away sin by his sacrifice, or that he is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. It doesn't even point in the direction of the New Test of the, these characteristic New Testament utterances. They all assume in the death of Jesus a relation to sin which has no parallel in martyrdom. On the cross, the sinless Son of God, in love to man, in obedience to the Father, entered submissively into that tragic experience in which sinful man, in which sinful men realize all that sin means. He tasted death for every man. The last and deepest thing we can say about his relation to our sins is that he died for them, that he bore them in his own body on the tree. If we could not say this, we could not say that he knew by experience all that sinful men find to be involved in their sin, nor could we say that he has been made perfect in love. Now there is, in this quotation I've just read, not only the impressiveness of this book, but also that limitation that many find in it, that there is a, a sort of mysticism about the death of Christ that is just not the case in his book titled simply The Death of Christ. And it may very well be the case that Christ is always to be joined with his work. He says again, it's perhaps necessary to remark that when we speak of the finished work of Christ, we do not think of separating the work from him who achieved it. The New Testament knows only of a living Christ, and all apostolic preaching of the Gospel holds up the living Christ to men. But the living Christ is Christ who died, and he has never preached apart from his death and its reconciling power. And it is his death that reconciles. Calvary is not a failure. Calvary is not something that needs to be corrected by Easter morn. Easter morn is a declaration of victory, it is not the victory. The victory is the cross. And so it is that we emphasise justification by faith alone. So, again, and the final quote I shall read here, Denny on Luther. Luther is abundantly right in his emphasis on faith alone. It is just the other side of Christ alone. Christ alone our reconciler. Christ alone our life. Christ alone our reconciliation. The Christian doctrine of reconciliation is a Christian doctrine of Christ because he is our reconciliation. Well, thank you for watching and may God help you in the reading of the best books and especially the best book of all, the Bible.